Welcome on, welcome all. Thank you for tuning in to Cedarly Radio, your guide to films playing at the Art House for the week of November 9th to November 15th. My name is Aaron Spears. And I'm Dave Huffman. On this week, we'll be discussing Elizabeth Chomko's What They Had and Mariel Heller's Can You Ever Forgive Me, which both open here at the Cedar Lee on Friday. We'll also be discussing the specialty box office, the importance of the Sundance Screenwriters Labs, and all their labs, really. The Oscar shortlist for Best Animated Films has been announced, and inspired by Mariel Heller's Can You Ever Forgive Me, we'll be discussing our favorite con artist films. But first, we always like to start the show with the last scene. So, Dave, what is the last film you've seen? Well, for once, I actually saw something classic. <gasps> the last thing I saw was the uh, Orson Welles' new film. Ah. Yes, uh, The Other Side of the Wind, uh, which I got to see this weekend at the Cinematheque on a 35 millimeter print, which is even more surprising. A, and that, it came from Netflix. Yeah, that Netflix, yeah. A, allowed it to be shown in a theater, which right, was nice right, of right. them. And then B, that they even made 35 millimeter prints was yeah. sort of shocking. Even John Ewing at the Cinematheque seemed genuinely surprised that he got a print. It's not like they just offered it up too. He wasn't like, do you have a 35 millimeter print? They were just like, would you like a 35 millimeter print? Right. And he was, yes, oh, of course. I would, absolutely. <laughs> so it was uh, absolutely wonderful to see that. And it's a unique very, it's interesting to see a film that is so much of the 70s. Right. That is a 2018 release. Yeah. <laughs> so it is very, very unique uh, cinematic experience. It is streaming now on Netflix as well. So you can check it out. Right. And there's a, a making of documentary, I think a little like yes. 50 minute thing on Netflix as well about it. Is that the uh, Morgan Neville documentary? I honestly don't know. Okay. I'm not going to. I'll say yes. Because All right. you, you said that with such authority that I'll, I'll believe <laughs> well, it. Well, I know it was on the festival circuit. There yeah. was uh, the director of uh, Won't You Be My Neighbor mm-hmm. and 20 Feet from Stardom. He was making a documentary about the making of gotcha. this lost or mm-hmm. yeah so. yeah it's it's a fascinating really interesting movie which i love that it had you know it was a great director directing other great directors because right, right. his his two leads are peter bogdanovich and john, and john houston, john houston. Yeah. so it's very really, so there's layers upon layers and layers. Yeah, and of yeah. course, it's a movie about a director not being able to finish this movie, and it's a movie that was unfinished by the director. So there's just a whole yeah. lot of meta, 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 yeah, meta, meta, meta stuff. But on like it. you it's said, really again, from the '70s when yeah. meta wasn't really no, a that thing, wasn't so. a thing yet. But yeah. Uh, yeah, it became that. And I, uh, you know, who knows how closely it is to actually what he would have done had he been able to finish it. Yeah. But I believe that they probably did their their due diligence to make it as close to his vision as possible. This doesn't exactly count as Cedarly Buzz, but a couple customers over the week. And also saw mm-hmm. it. And the one comment the one gentleman told me was, what poor editor is stuck having to edit <laughs> Orson Welles, you know, all these years later? Like, yeah. Ooh, Ooh. yeah. Cause he was saying he thought maybe he could use a little bit better editing, but like, who wants to make those cuts to Orson Welles? Oh, you know, I would work, disagree so. with that. Ooh. I mean, the editing, it's just, it's a jolting different style. It is not. Okay. And uh, when you, when the film started out, actually, it was with my fiance, and about five minutes into the movie, he just leaned over to me and he's like, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> and I'm like, just let just it unfold. Just go with it. Yeah, because, it's only five minutes. Like, it is not a, it's not a story, like, it's not a plot driven kind of thing. It's, right. it's, you know, there's, you just have to kind of let the, let it, the, let it happen. Let it happen. And, yeah. you know, you've got the film within the film, and then you've got all these different documentary filmmakers filming the characters right. of the making of the film and there's just a lot of layers to it but it's it's when you watch the whole thing it all does it come all together works. and okay. it really works excellent i'll so, be watching that shortly please do um a movie which i wish i hadn't let happen was what i saw last <laughs> so uh we did a, a swap here so i watched some garbage this, this week <laughs> <laughs> and that was the movie uh guardians from russia or the soviet union oh, uh, yeah. from 2017 I didn't see it yeah it's uh, garbage, huh? It's I mean, it's it's fun garbage. I'll okay. give it that. I mean, it's right. no hurricane heist, but uh, it's you know, it's it's still kind of fun garbage. It's uh, directed by uh, Sarek Andreasen. He did a movie I watched, Mafia, M A F I Y A, from a year before, which is kind of a more fun sci fi yeah, movie than this one. one is. The problem with this one though is that it's not long enough. It's essentially um, like There's a something fantastic four like Marvel style right. superhero movie. One guy's a bear. One guy's awesome with these like really sick uh, blades that he uh-huh. cuts up. One guy can move rocks and things with his his mind. Everybody, but it's an origin story for all four characters. And it's really confusing. I think it was poorly subtitled, too, because it's one of those things, almost like an old Godzilla movie, where like they're talking a lot, right. and you get like one line of dialogue subtitled. I'm like, no, no, there's got to be more to it than that. Um, so it's basically it's a you know Marvel style superhero movie, um, all set from like they were uh, Cold War Russia, then you know reawakened in the present to fight you know this new evil, good bad guy. It's okay, but it's like an hour and twenty five minutes, and the huh. credits start. It was like no 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 like. You the origin stories alone more, are like right. eight second montages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, no, there's got to be, this hmm. must be cut down for American audiences or something. I don't know, but it hmm. just didn't. You don't know if work. there was a longer. Cut I didn't do that much research because I was just kind of angry when gotcha. I was done. So I was like, eh, whatever. Whatever. But it, it has the feel where, like, okay, they're 
probably trying to set up a franchise, mm-hmm. maybe because you could keep going with it as a uh, you know as a Russian superhero kind of story there. Right. Well, I would but, still be curious to see it just because uh, the idea of a, a Russian Avengers movie with a guy turning into a bear sounds fun. It is pretty. Yeah, I mean, it's that level. It, but it's also like we've mentioned on the show. I believe, if not, we'll mention it now. I know we've mentioned it in person. Don't just watch the best foreign language film nominees right. from other countries. Watch some of their action movies. Yeah. Watch a dumb comedy. Mm-hmm. Watch everything else. So that was why I was like, you know, I haven't. I don't remember the last time I watched it. Well, except for the other guy's movie, uh, his other movie, Mafia. Uh, you know, Russian action. You know, superhero movie. Why not? So I got you. Got to expand your horizons every mm-hmm. now and then. Uh, in the art house news this week, let's check in with the specialty box office real quick. A uh, movie we're opening next week, Boy Erased, uh, mm-hmm. came out in limited release. Was averaging about forty four thousand per screen average, which I've started to notice as we're kind of checking in with specialty box office each week that um, I'm not a huge fan of the whole horse race aspect of <laughs> right. like, you know, what's going to be number at the box office? This is going to be the biggest thing ever because it doesn't apply that way with a specialty box office not usually because just like we said last week with suspiria yeah. opening up with you know Huge. almost a ninety thousand per screen average yeah. and then when they expanded it out to other theaters it went down to like a three thousand uh, dollar right you know so it's not Which is like, natural how that's right. going to work mm-hmm. but yep it's uh it's also like i don't want to be too disheartening but about it but it as a you know a business you mm-hmm. know in an art house theater you want to get the hits in yeah and those are some early indications of our audiences connecting with it or mm-hmm. not this one seems more realistic to me because yes. it's not like the headline grabbing biggest opening of mm-hmm. you know of, of the but year or anything but it's a solid opening and so. great reviews and yeah and we'll i won't talk about it yet because we'll talk about it next that's week. very true mm-hmm. uh continued success though at the especially box of us was beautiful boy which we are currently showing mm-hmm. that just crossed the three million mark which is good for you know independent uh finance film there and can you ever forgive me which we'll be talking about shortly cracked a million and yep. free solo is continuing its trajectory of being I, that's got to be the the highest grossing rock climbing movie ever at uh, almost <laughs> seven million which is also just a really really good uh financial return for a documentary of, right. of any genre really uh, we did want to mention real quick i noticed a trend in the two movies we're opening this week the sundance film festival mm-hmm. very famous probably the most famous american independent film festival yes absolutely out there uh is more than just a festival they've got all these different uh labs they call right. them uh directors screenwriters all kinds of things mm-hmm. it's sort of uh kickstarting american independent cinema in a way because it's giving first-time filmmakers a lot of experience right. it connects them with their peers who are already professionals mm-hmm. working in the industry that sort of thing uh, a couple of projects I wanted to highlight real quick before we get into this week's movies that we've played here at the theater. Fruitvale Station, Ryan Coogler's first yep. film. Obviously, he was he's in the middle of a very, very successful mm-hmm. year and uh, hopefully beginning of a career going right now. Uh, Whiplash, Damien Chazelle's film, right. came out of there. Obviously. Oscar, uh, Oscar, Oscar winner now, yep. yeah. Pariah D. Rees, uh, mm-hmm. first, I believe it was her first feature, came out of the Sundance so. Lab mm-hmm. as well. And uh, The Witch, Robert Eggers' film from two years ago now, I believe. Yep, Art House Horror the, Movie. Yeah, mm-hmm. Art House Horror Movie, uh, which I guess I don't th- we did not we pick did not last week, but it is a great one. But I, I love I um, The Witch. And he's got a new one coming out next year called The Lighthouse with Robert Pattinson and Willem Dafoe, which hmm. I, I'm buying a ticket right now yeah. for that. That sounds amazing. Just this calendar year alone, we had American Animals, the mm-hmm. Bart Leiden film. Uh, sorry to bother you uh, with Boots Riley's film, uh, another first time filmmaker. And uh, We the Animals were all out of the Sundance lab and played at Sundance this past year yep. as well. Um, and then this weekend, we have what they had Elizabeth Chomko's film. That's her writing and directing debut that came out of the lab. And also, uh, Mariel Heller, who is uh, the director of Can You Ever Forgive Me, right. started her career out there at the lab there too. You go. So, so good shout out to the Sundance lab. Yeah, they do. Obviously, I mean, that's one of the great things that. Robert Redford's leaving several legacies in cinema history, obviously, oh, yeah, his, his acting career and his directing career, but I think his his contribution of starting the Sundance Film Festival and the Sundance oh, Institute yeah. has been you know, and so crucial to developing young filmmakers and really fostering a lot of great talent. So thank you, Mr. Redford. Appreciate it. Uh, the Oscars are... A little, little bit away. Nominations come out in a couple mm-hmm. months, but it's uh, always the fall season is Oscar watch time. Yep. And... I've been watching the Oscars for a while, especially working at Art House Theater. I'm still amazed every year there's something where I'm like, oh, I didn't know they do it that way yeah, kind of thing. The, so I thought this might be a good opportunity on the show to kind of share with the listeners like right. how some of this stuff works. Well, yeah, specifically we're going to talk right now about the animated films because it seems like every year when the animated films come out, yeah, usually the Pixar movie gets nominated. Right, and it's like some, th- three heard, to five movies. Yeah, it's and, usually... Yeah, it's usually Lately, it has been pretty much five every year. I think year, so, I yeah. Think. So, and when they started, it but, was like three or yeah, four at a time. It, it, it's going to be at least three, maximum of five is one of the category rules. And you have to submit to be considered 
and then you have to uh, go through the committee process. It's right. not just like one of the things where the whole kind of academy votes. It's a committee that kind of selects them down to the final ones, and right. then the whole uh, academy does vote on the finals. But the there's always one of those movies that that gets nominated that people have never heard of. It's usually a foreign animated yes, one, exactly. or a little little film, and a lot of those are the ones that we've played here at the yes, Cedar Lee. In fact, looking at the list of some of the films. Oh, you're going to ruin my quiz. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, what do these have in common? Well, because, no, I mean, we've got We've actually, played a lot of them. Right. We have, we've played quite a few that are on this list, like uh, MFKZ, which Correct. we just played. Um, we've got um, Machio and the Promised Flowered Blooms. Yep. We've played that twice. Twice, yeah. As a uh, subtitled and as a dubbed. Uh, the Night is Short, Walk on Girl. I mean, there's just a lot of great movies. Fireworks. Here Fireworks. We do yeah. that one. And where there's one that's coming up this week that we're playing called uh, Liz and the Bluebird. Yep. So you've got a chance to see that this coming Tuesday. So then when the nom- Oscar nominations come out in January, you won't be like, I've never heard of that right. movie. Right. No, you I've already say, seen it. I've and already it's great. seen it. I'm so ahead of the curve. We also have one in uh, December 5th. We're showing uh, Mirai, M-I-R-A-I, mm-hmm. yes. uh, which is also on their short list. So these are all the ones and that the That one I've been hearing submitted. amazing yeah. things about. So that, that movie is apparently one of the best films of the year. So um, uh, I haven't seen several of these, and I really wanted to see MFKZ because that one seemed really interesting. But I And crazy. It. And crazy, yeah. yeah. A combination of French animation and Japanese animation yeah. style. But set in like a post-apocalyptic, yeah, it, I think L.A. Yeah, or someplace it, in America, it, yeah. It looked pretty amazing. So, But there are you know other mainstream ones that are nominated, obviously, or that, that could be nominated. These are you know like Isle of Dogs, which you played here right, at the yeah. Cedar Lee. So there's a, a lot of great films that are coming up here, but you could just, um, you know... Pay attention to all the little ones that we're playing some right. of these one-off shows because they might be future Oscar nominees. Cedar Lee Theater, your one-stop shop for potential Oscar Academy there you go. <laughs> Academy Award for mm-hmm. uh, Best Animated Film. And we've, we've discussed before, too, like the technical aspect to it, where a right. lot of times it, when they... Being also at a more recent category, I remember like we were around when they started the animation mm-hmm. category... A lot of the nominations came out, and like when I remember, Secret of the Kells was one where I was right. like, "What? What is that?" Yeah, and I watched it. It was like, "It's gorgeous." Yeah, like it. It seems like a a, a category where they do really uh, pay attention to the technical merits mm-hmm. of the film too. So, yep. you know. Uh, Although, you know, Shrek did one, so whatever. But. <laughs> well, the first Shrek is a great movie. I just don't care for that one. Uh, but, uh, you know, like Incredibles 2 might be right. the hard one to beat this year it's because true. it is an excellent movie and it made a kajillion dollars. Right. But it would be awesome if one of these little, you know, yeah, if animated MFKZ sneaks yeah, in and steals it or something. Yeah, beats the big guy. That would be awesome. But it probably won't happen. But, you know, you never know. You never know. Uh, Cedar Lee Buzz this week. Uh, the two new movies that we opened, Beautiful Boy and Suspiria. Beautiful Boy, uh, people have been really enjoying, but. Enjoying? People- Okay, people have been seeing, appreciating, <laughs> and appreciating, yes. appreciating. That's the right word. They've been appreciating, but they just have that exhausted look on their right. face when they come out because yeah. it's an exhausting movie. Yeah. But uh, a lot of comments on like it's very much an actor's kind of movie. If you really just enjoy great performances, uh, that is a movie to uh, check out. Suspiria, mm-hmm. I guess, is a similar story. People walk yeah. out fairly jarred right. <laughs> watching it, that one. It's a, it's a, it's you know, again, Suspiria, not a movie for everybody, but right. the people that like it love it a lot. Yes. I really appreciated it. And uh, it is a film that, like we said, opened up really huge in New York and L.A., right. but once it's expanded around the country, it didn't do as great. Um, sort of like all the fans rushed to see it at one show, and then Very that much, was pretty yeah. much um, the, the, the first few shows were busy, and then it hasn't really been that busy over the weekend. So if you're excited and interested in seeing Suspiria, I see would not now. wait too long because it probably won't be here for months and months. It might just Because it's a crowded a season with all kinds of these uh, yes. you know, films Every, vying for different awards and nominations. Yep. So it moves along if there isn't a huge crowd for it and, this time and of year. I would say that Suspiria could have like a strange outside chance of some Oscar nominations in some of the more technical kind of sure. categories, but I don't think it's going to be a main contender for anything like his last film was uh, right. Call Me By Your Name. I was say, once, you're, once you're sort of in with the Academy, though, like right. Luca People Guarani pay attention in there, to it. Yeah. they're going to pay attention to it, yep. so they might be more apt to be like, oh, Tilda Swinton is yeah. fantastic yep. again. Let's exactly. you know, recognize her in this mm-hmm. case. So. Uh, we'll be right back to preview the new film's opening this week. Let's go to the movies. Oh, but it's so expensive. Come on, the big screen, the popcorn. How much could it really cost? Okay, get out your calculator. Got it. All right, add it up. Uh, tickets, popcorn, candy, drinks, hot dogs, pretzels, cookies. Dad, Here, that's wh- way too much food. Yeah, okay, okay, but how much is it? It's like $1,000. See, it's too expensive. Give me a break. It's Monday. It's only $5 at all the Cleveland Cinemas locations, plus discounted concession items. You work there. You should know this. Come on, man. All right, all right, all right. 
good. I'm sold. Let's go to the movies. Are there restrictions or fine print I should worry about? Probably. You're the grown-up. You should check on that. ClevelandCinemas.com would be a good place to start, or people could just ask you at the theater. Hey, 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 hey. This is my day off. I want to be incognito. What's that? It means invisible. I don't think that's what it means. We have two new films opening this weekend. The first one is What They Had from writer-director Elizabeth Chomko. This is her debut feature as a writer and director. It tells the story of Bridget, who returns home at her brother's urging to deal with her ailing mother and her father's reluctance to kind of let go of their life together. Mickey? What do you mean she's gone? Daddy. You ought to be home with your family. Is she all right? She's fine. Is that my baby? I've been telling them for years, you got to figure out what you want to do with mom when the time comes, because we all know how this thing works. I'm sorry. I ought to be here more often. You got family. You got girls. You got a husband. You're here plenty. She was trying to go home. She thinks she's still a little girl, and she can't figure out why she's stuck here. Who's that? Oh, what is that? You know who that is? He's my boyfriend. See? This is, a, the, like I said, her debut feature, uh, Ms. Chomko. She's been primarily working on stage as a right. playwright and an actress for years. So having that kind of background there, this has another feel, like I mentioned with Beautiful Boy, like it's very much an actor's kind of yeah. movie. It's performance-based. She's got a great cast of Hilary Swank, right. Robert Forster, Blythe Danner, and Michael Shannon. Mm-hmm. That's a nice little quiz for yep, me there. A lot of Oscar nominations. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and two-time Oscar winner, Hilary Swank. That's true. Just comes out of nowhere usually and just wins the award. If she gets nominated, she wins. And all the other actresses yeah. have to like just shudder in fear of Hilary Swank. And isn't really like super prolific either like you mentioned oh, when all. we opened Colette yeah. you were like oh Karen Knightley's been missing in action yep. for a little bit on the art house scene and I th- feel like Hil- Hilary Swank even more so yeah. like really picks her roles mm-hmm. very specifically and uh, with purpose yes when she sees something there uh, we had uh, John Foreman, the president of Cleveland Cinemas and founder of the Cleveland Film Festival, on a few epi- several mm-hmm. episodes several ago, episodes. reporting on the Toronto International Film Festival, and this was one of the movies that he yeah, had highlighted. He really, was really, really enjoying mm-hmm. this one. Yeah. It does have that uh, air about it of very serious because mm-hmm. it's dealing with you know the mental decline of uh, a loved one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it is based on Elizabeth Chomko's uh, grandma, from what I've read. It's very right. personal, it's personal story to story. her. But uh, I think John mentioned as well, like there's also, there's a lot of humor though too. It's right. not one of those that's just all downer all the time. It is the ups and downs of family life and yep. uh, dealing with, you know, what your life was as a family and how that kind of slips away as time goes by and how people deal with that. It certainly is. Uh, it's probably going to be on a lot of people's, uh, you know, kind of critics list at the end of the year. I don't know if it'll be a huge Oscar contender just because it is such a small little film. But again, yeah. with that cast and the, could be the, the caliber of the could. people, you just never know. Yeah. Again, I never count out Hillary Swank whenever she's in something that gets good reviews. And I'm a big fan of Michael Shannon. And this oh, yeah, is one of those amazing. rare roles where it's like, oh, he's not playing a serial killer. Yeah, he's or not a creep, a creep. Or a stalker. <laughs> I'm interested. He's just a bar owner and hmm. you know uh, a loving brother who he's wants to take care of his parents he's not getting his parents, fingers so. shot off in yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Shape of Water spoiler alert so I guess you're supposed to say spoiler alert before you give away a plot point right oh well whoops <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't seen Shape of Water by now shame on you shame yeah. on you and the other film we're opening this week is Can You Ever Forgive Me by director Mariel Heller. And this is the true story of Lee Israel, who is a best-selling celebrity biographer, who, once she fell on hard times, decided to come up with a more creative way to make income, which included forging uh, authors' letters uh, and then selling them on the collectibles market. Nobody is going to pay for the writer Lee Israel right now. I'm months behind in my rent, and my cat is sick. It's four in the afternoon, and you're drunk. I'm hardly drunk. Craig, no problem. My suggestion to you is you go out there and you find another way to make a living. Recently found this delightful sign letter. Fanny Bryce, one of my favorites. I could give you 75. Oh. I could give more for better content. It's a bit bland is all. Yeah, I can definitely get a lot more for this one. I mean, the PS makes it priceless. Quite by accident, I find myself in a rather criminal position. What criminal activity could possibly be involved in, except a crime of fashion, of course? I'm embellishing literary letters by prominent writers. I love his writing. Particularly clever, don't you think? Caustic wit. (sighs) This is quite something. These are wonderful. I thought so, too. Name your price. 
So can you ever forgive me? Is uh, Melissa McCarthy is potentially she's been a past Oscar nomination uh, or Oscar nominee for uh, she was yeah for bridesmaids. Oh, bridesmaids. That's and, right. Okay. Yeah. So and she has a very good chance of getting a nomination yeah. for obviously bridesmaids. A very broad comedic performance. Which I just is always great. forget that sometimes comedies get yeah very some rarely, love at the Oscars, but, they but yeah, no, she's do. Great. And this is a very um, very different kind of role for her, and it's great. And Richard E. Grant uh, is her kind of cohort and best friend in this movie and he's also just fantastic and it would be great if he gets an oscar nomination for supporting but i don't know if that'll happen but it might yeah, you right. never know yeah. because he is just wonderfully seen stealing in most of the stuff that he does and he's just really really great but uh the film we saw we had a screening of it here at the cedar lee a couple weeks ago the audience really just loved it so i think it's going to be one of those films that plays for a little while here at the cedar lee i have a question about this one because i haven't seen this one mm-hmm. yet but the trailer again on the episode when um uh, mr foreman was on talking about the yeah. Toronto Film Festival, he saw it there. I had mentioned that the trailer, I thought, kind of played up the comedic elements sure. a little bit more, which I think you need to do because of the star that's mm-hmm. in it, and it'll get people out to it. But like, what genre do you would you play? Is it more it's, specifically a drama? It's definitely a drama. Okay. I mean, it is funny, though. There right. are, you know, you've got two really strong comedic actors right. because Richard E. Grant and Melissa McCarthy are really funny. Well, three and you count Jane Curtin, and, too. Yeah, so, and yeah. Jane Curtin has... Uh, it's so good to see Jane Curtin, especially on the big screen. That's yeah. surprising. She plays her... Um, very no nonsense publisher who's just like no one's gonna buy no one wants a oh, right. biography of Fanny Bryce you right know? yeah <laughs> so it's uh it's she's it's good to see Jane Curtin but the uh, uh the film is primarily a drama but okay. it is really there are laugh out loud moments and right. there's definitely very funny parts to it it's one of those two when you have a someone who's basically known for comedies mm-hmm. I feel like people are a little bit more uh, ready to laugh at yes. any small joke in that movie is probably gonna that get a bigger true. laugh just because they're used mm-hmm. to laughing. But, I was going to say at her, but with her. But it is ultimately, movies. you know, kind of, uh, it's it's a sad story because it's, it's, it's about, tragic. yeah, I mean, it's a woman who's, you know, struggling and, and, and you know, and has to resort to criminal activity to, right, to you survive. know, survive. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. I did read and do a little research on this one, doing a little research on this film. Now that you've seen the movie, could you picture Julianne Moore playing the part instead of Melissa McCarthy? Yeah, I could. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, Julianne Moore's amazing. So, no, she yeah. is, but it, like I, I've just, but probably it's a, uh, one of the things of working here. I've seen that trailer like fifty some times right. at this point because you know I see it every day when I'm at work and it's it, playing at the theater. It would have had a different, it would have been a different, different slightly feel. different film. But yeah, yeah absolutely. I think uh, if they probably. I don't know. Maybe I mean, although Julianne Moore can be very funny, so oh, I don't absolutely, know that, yeah, yeah. Not, I was going to say maybe the comedic moments would be a little different, but that's I, kind of what I was yeah. wondering because I'm not like she can be very funny yeah. and is very funny, but I don't necessarily would in this story. If I was watching Julianne Moore play the part mm-hmm. who was originally cast, yeah, I don't know if maybe the the laughs would have hit. I as think strong. it would have maybe hit as as a little more, more dramatic, and yeah, tragic, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, sadder kind of thing. She probably would have brought a amped that up a little bit. But Melissa McCarthy is really, really good and empathetic in it. And we'll be right back with our Cedar Lee three picks for favorite con artist films inspired by Can You Ever Forgive Me? And we are back with our Cedar Lee three picks for this week. Each week we take inspiration from one of the films that we are opening and pick our three films that kind of circle around that idea. This week we're looking at con artist films inspired by Can You Ever Forgive Me and uh, Lee Israel's con job with her uh, partner in crime. It seemed like a topic. I was like, "Oh, that's a very narrow subject," as oh, no. it seems like the case with all of the topics <laughs> we end up picking around here. Uh, so, you know, dirty rotten scoundrels. Mm-hmm. Uh, David Mamet obviously mm-hmm. comes to mind. Uh, and then, as I stayed up way too late last night, kind of doing some research and looking through my film library, I was like, "There's all these different kinds of con artist films. Yep. There's the twist ending that mm-hmm. you don't see coming because the audience isn't yep. in on the con. And then, conversely, oh, the audience is in on the con. You right. get to see the con happen, like a." The Oceans films mm-hmm. or whatever. Like you right, see, right, like, right. here's the plan. Here's what we're going to go and do. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, at the end, I was like, oh, I got a good list together. I feel, oh, wait, documentaries. I feel like you're just trying to like get more a films. Few more, you yeah, keep yeah. mentioning different They're titles because you didn't want just, you to know. like narrow down your list. I think that's what's happened here. <laughs> but uh, So, yeah, that, that's kind of where I was coming mm-hmm. from and the ones that I picked. So I did a kind of a sampling here. All right. That, so what uh, was your first one? I did. Uh, I'm going to go with my documentary first because it ties directly into your mm-hmm. last scene, knowing that the Orson Welles uh, movie, The Other Side of the... The Other Side of the Wind. wind. Sorry, mm-hmm. I couldn't yeah. say room for some reason. <laughs> other Side of the Room. The Other Side of the Wind was out. Uh, my One of the first documentaries I saw very early on, uh, library rental when I was in high school, uh, library, and there was like, oh, you like documentaries? You should see F for Fake, this mm. Orson Welles movie. And I was mm-hmm. like, what is this? And I didn't know it was a documentary. I just thought yeah. it was an Orson Welles movie. So yeah. uh, F for Fake from 73, it's about fraud. It's about uh, art fraud and yep. fakery. There's um, a little bit about Clifford Irving, who wrote a Howard Hughes biography and or a fake Howard Hughes right. biography. 
um, which also had a movie. Yeah, it did. The, mm-hmm. the hoax. I yeah, believe. not one of my picks. Mm-hmm. Not the hoax. <laughs> Sticking with that for fake. But you're just trying. to And sneak there was an in art there. forger, but it was also about like how film itself is kind of fake and yeah. can con people. And then the documentary itself kind of like pulls a con on the audience mm-hmm. as you're watching it. It's just a. Uh, it's hard to describe, but it's a really twisty, turny, amazing Orson Welles documentary. Upon layers upon Again, yeah, layers. yeah, yep. like mm-hmm. the side of the wind, layers and layers, and also very meta for the '70s, mm-hmm. which. I'd be curious to rewatch F for Fake uh, when I hit Netflix yeah. uh, in the near future. Watch Outside of the Wind to see. I am going to be rewatching uh, F is for Fake. Uh, actually, uh, I just was. I'm borrowing it from a friend. After Excellent dinner last night. So yes, uh, and then well, you mentioned kind of teasing along one of my picks where you said David Mamet because the first film that popped into my head was David Mamet's House of Games House. from 1987. Ah, yes. And it's just, I think, kind of maybe the best con artist movie. Yeah. Uh, even though I kind of hate Lindsay Krause's performance in it, I feel like she's sort of like the so sleepy wooden. kind of wooden yeah. presence that, but that was his wife at the time. So what's <laughs> right, he going right. to do? <laughs> Sorry, honey, you can't be in my movie. Right, That's, right. So he, he probably sacrificed uh, a, a better artistic choice just to keep, you know, right. keep, marital keep uh, happy. happiness. <laughs> but it was, uh, it is a great movie and it's just, lots of twist and you don't see what's coming and the less you know about it the better just right. watch house of games if you have not seen it is that one where the i feel like mammoth sort of specialty was the audience feels like they're in on the con yes. a little bit but then oh not oh, really yep mm-hmm. um, exactly so you you think you know the direction it's going but you yeah. get the the double turnaround yeah mm-hmm. yep i'm gonna go with uh i'm gonna do my classic one actually next which is uh, Babyface from 1933, oh. which I mm-hmm. just uh, recently in the last, I want to say calendar year, I think, the Cleveland Muse- Museum of Art program did in the the pre-release, not edited by the right. Hayes Code kind mm-hmm. of. Yep, the pre-code um, classics. The pre-co- mm-hmm. pre-code classic series they had there with uh, Barbara Stanwyck. Mm-hmm. It's one of those, 1933 again, obviously, you know, black and white, early sound. And as you're watching it going, wait a minute, is, is, is her dad prostituting her out of his <laughs> speakeasy and uh like yeah she's yeah. 14 yeah that's what's uh, happening. or there's a reference to her being yeah. you know starting right. at 14 you're like oh wow okay mm-hmm. that but it's not played as this harsh you know right gritty realism because at the time that's just not the way it was portrayed mm-hmm. it's all hinted uh the father's out of the picture his uh, illegal still blows up and she heads to the big city mm-hmm. after a local guy quotes nietzsche to her <laughs> and says about how like use your feminine wilds to get ahead in life she's right. like i could uh-huh uh, so she does she literally sleeps away to the top of a corporation yep. and just lie after lie mm-hmm. after lie and just throwing everybody she can under the bus to get ahead this doesn't sound familiar at all <laughs> and uh <laughs> that's how aaron has achieved his yeah, success yeah exactly that's it yep uh but it's one of those like it still holds up very well today and right. it, as a modern audience watching you're kind of going i can't believe that's in this movie because yeah. you just picture these black and white you know classic movies well, as being just so sanitized well and, some of the pre-code things like you watch them and you're like i don't even get why they're why like they were but then there's yeah. some of them that are absolutely very salacious and right barbara stanwick seems to have been in a lot of those a lot yeah, of them yeah she yeah. was, no, good she for was her. sort of like the poster child <laughs> pushing some buttons there of the pre-code uh classics yeah I, I love her. And of course, this isn't on my list, but you could say like Double Indemnity, which is like the ultimate oh, absolutely, part of the yeah. You know, that is a great, Very much a con artist you know, movie. Con artist movie. Um, well, my next pick is another black and white film, but it's not of that kind of classic Hollywood period. But it is uh, Peter Bogdanovich's Paper Moon from 1973 featuring Ryan and Tatum O'Neill. Uh, he is a kind of a just a really low-end bible salesman huckster just ripping off widows trying to you know showing up on their doorstep to sell them bibles saying that their dead husband ordered it for him right before he but right before he died <laughs> and you know it's the golden embossed one so it's more money right and, right and you know he takes uh this little girl who may or may not be his daughter he's just supposed to be returning her to her next of kin mm-hmm. and then she ends up being just a naturalist she's an even better con artist than him oh yeah kids and, are great yeah, con artists. she <laughs> she is fantastic she won an Oscar for it and it's it's really just a great funny charming little movie and it's sort of as I was thinking about these so often uh in these movies you think about the um con artists you're sort of cheering for them you know like you mentioned oh, Dirty yeah, Rotten yeah. Scoundrels right. you're like well these are terrible people right but you're sort They're of funny. rooting They're for theory. them yeah, yeah you're yeah. like so this is again you're like you want a good con right you're 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 if you appreciate them yeah. which is I'll save my third choice to, to kind of show that they're <laughs> not always okay. not always the delightful people. Oh, well, that's a good segue to my third choice as yeah, well. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> my, my third choice is uh, The Wolf of Wall Street oh, from okay. 2013, mm-hmm. which is an exhausting movie. It is. It's you know, well over two mm-hmm. hours, but it's at such a breakneck pace. Yeah. Uh, that's why it's exhausting to me to watch because it moves so quick. 
Um, again, but I still think you're supposed, he's supposed to be likable in that movie. Like he is a likable person. He is, I think, because there's some comedy mixed in there, and Jonah Hill's character is just so absurd and crazy. Yep. that I've noticed that also with watching um, Black Klansman again recently. How just by laughing at the clan members in that movie, mm-hmm. you're accidentally kind of endeared sure. slightly to them as characters, mm-hmm. not just these cardboard cutouts of evil. But Wolf of Wall Street objectively is a horrible person. Yeah. He's just, you know... Uh, well, all of these people are objectively terrible people because they're, well, they're deceiving, kind of, so they're deceiving and you know, right, stealing right. from other people, basically. But it's just like, uh, this one is the one where you, you do see the hustle. Mm-hmm. I don't feel like I was ever cheering for him, but I was fascinated by like, when is it, this can't, you can't just build an entire yeah. career on lying just to yep. make money. Oh, no, no you, you can. You can. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, it's it's the one too, I just wanted to mention, uh, being a Martin Scorsese fanatic, he directed that movie when he was 70 years old. Mm-hmm. So picture, you know, your uncle, your grandpa, whoever, who's 70, and then picture what it would take to make <laughs> The Wolf of Wall Street. And I love that his follow-up after that was Silence, which is yeah. the most like meditative, mm-hmm. interesting, introspective movie. But Wolf of Wall Street felt to me like, um, somebody right out of film school trying yeah. to make a mark for themselves and look what I can do and all the tricks are on screen and everything's mm-hmm. in, everything, uh, no, it's a, everything's it's a, in the story It's there, a great but. movie and of course even behind the scenes of the making of that movie there was cons because the people the right. financing and stuff if you know about like um, you know all the people that kind of turned out to give gave him some money right. maybe that money didn't come from all the best places right, so, right, yeah, yeah. so it's a, got some layers to that one as well <laughs> well my final pick is one of my favorite movies uh, kind of a cult film called The Honeymoon Killers from 1970 by Leonard Castle and Donald Volkman. And it stars Shirley Stoller and Tony, Tony Lobianco as, uh, or Lobianca, I can't remember if it's O or A, but he, they're both, um, she's this very frumpy nurse that uh, falls in love with this very swarthy, you know, Latino guy who yeah. uh, is, you know, paying her attention and, they you know fall in love and get married and then but they start running these little scams where he writes to other like lonely hearts ladies and then he goes and basically they seduce these women and then right. get their money and then kill these women and <laughs> and you know it's just they're terrible, terrible people. Yeah, yeah. And it really is. I mean, these are murderers. The other ones yeah. are just like kind of like, well, we're stealing your money, but you know. Right, right. We're, yeah. But we're not just, like a body count. I'm just taking eight dollars from a widow, <laughs> yeah. you know, in in paper moon. I'm yeah. not just like, you know, actually murdering the people. Right. Whereas these con artists, they're like deceiving people in the worst way by, you know, playing with their hearts and then killing and them. And then killing so, them. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a great movie and a in a wonderful kind of drive in grindhousey sort of way. And the Criterion edition does have a, a very nice uh, edition of that as well. Oh, nice. Mm-hmm. That's also uh, a subgenre of the con artists would be like the uh, lovers on the run, kind of, yes. you know, oh. killers mm-hmm. and, you know, I gun crazy this. and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Well, those are our Cedar Lead 3 picks for this week. If you'd like to share some of your favorite con artist films that we uh, may have missed, or maybe just the ones I hinted at at the beginning mm-hmm. when I snuck yeah, in my extra picks there, dropping in some. share those with us mm-hmm. on social media, uh, at Cedar Lead Theater, using the hashtag Cedar Lead 3, the number three. Before we sign off for this week, we do have a few special events to inform you about going on here at the theater. The marathon session of The Met Mm -hmm. uh, continues this Saturday with Marnie, an opera adaptation of a book that Hitchcock adapted as well, which is kind of fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. If you want kind of an, an introduction into opera... I would recommend seeing something like that. If about being a Hitchcock fan, I've seen Marnie a few times. That would be an opera to go check out. Do you know if this one's in English or is it in a uh, different I language? Do not, actually. I That's do a not good know. question. Because I've always found it distracting whenever I've seen yeah. an opera sung in English. Yeah. I've, I went to see like uh, the... Oh, if it's uh, sung in English? Yeah. Okay. Because I went to see Cronenberg's uh, directed an opera version of The Fly yeah. out in LA. And it was very distracting having it all sung in English. Huh. I, I just, it doesn't sound right. It just seems. Oh, just, okay. Yeah, like saying, I, yeah, yeah. you're so used to hearing it yeah. in a foreign language that when it's in English, you're like, wait, huh, this is just sounds a little opera. strange. This is, a, this is the dirty English language. Of course, that opera, also, that opera has also had a lot of like science fiction y kind it's of terms fly, yeah. being <laughs> sung at you. So it was a little extra. It's odd. Odd too. <laughs> <laughs> well, so our, our showing of the Met uh, Marnie Live will be Saturday, November 10th at 1255 p.m., the Encore Show, Wednesday, November 14th at 6 30 p.m. And then we are continuing our Late Shift film series with The Room, showing uh, it shows every month, the second Saturday of the month at 10 o'clock. So this Saturday, November 10th, it will be playing again. Bring your own spoons and, uh, you know, just have some fun with a bunch of weirdos. And Fathom Events and TCM continue their uh, Classics on the Big Screen series with the 
Wow, it's already been 30 years. 30th anniversary mm-hmm. of Die Hard, showing Sunday, November 11th, and Wednesday, November 14th at 2 p.m. and 7 p.m. both days. It's an action masterpiece, and it gets you ready for the Christmas season. I would say it's a little early for me. It's a little early. I always watch that in December, yeah, but, uh, watch it you know, it's fine. Well. But this is the big screen, it so is. and i got to mm-hmm. come see it. And uh, then we also have uh, another Fathom event on Monday evening, the 12th at 7 o'clock. We'll be showing the, I believe it's the 25th anniversary show of Batman, Mask of the Phantasm. That one also has a feature. I'm a big Warner Brothers animation fan. They're showing uh, Rabbit Rider beforehand Mm -hmm. uh, along there because Warner Brothers was the company that did the animated uh, Mm -hmm. Batman back then. Uh, speaking of animation, we do have, as we previously mentioned, a uh, potential Academy Award nominee for Best Animated Film, Liz and the Bluebird, showing on Tuesday, November 13th at 7.30 p.m. This is the true showing of the subtitled version. Yes. It's nothing mm-hmm. dubbed here. So subtitled version of Liz and the Bluebird, Tuesday, November 13th at 7.30. And I would just encourage people that, you know, I think a lot of people sometimes think about animation just being for kids or something. Yeah. They really need to get over that. Right. Because I'm it, one of those people. Yeah, like, no. I still watch a lot of animation for for adults, yeah. but uh, no, I think it, there's so many great movies out there yeah. that it's just another way that a, an artist expressed themselves. Yeah, absolutely, and some, especially in Japan, where uh, animation isn't just for kids; it is right. very much an adult thing. So when yeah. you see some of these Japanese animated films, they're dramas, they're like sad stories yeah. about people dealing with whatever, and they're it's just a beautiful way to tell a story. So I would encourage you to come out and see one of those if you have not. It's also the type of storytelling where you're starting from scratch. Right. Like you can't just set down a camera and start recording. You have to think of sound. You mm-hmm. have to think of the setting. You have to think of everything and create it from yep. scratch. On next week's episode, we'll be discussing Joel Edgerton's Boy Erased and Paul Dano's Wildlife. Inspired by Boy Erased, we'll be discussing our favorite, we're going to call them triple threat yes. artists, uh, actor, writer, and director, yes. uh, which uh, Joel is on Boy Erased. Uh, submit your picks if you'd like at Cedarly Theater using the hashtag Cedarly3, the number three. As always, thank you for tuning in to Cedarly Radio and lending us your ears this week. All the music heard on the show is original music written by Grant Heinemann and performed by the New Heights Jazz Ensemble, used with their permission, of course. Visit ClevelandCinemas.com for correct showtimes and to purchase advanced tickets. Also, there are links in the show notes. You can use those if you'd like as well. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We are at Cedarly Theater, spelled with an R-E at the end because we're fancy like that. Don't forget to subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcast. And while you're subscribing, leave us a rating and review or better yet, tell a fellow film geek about the show. We'll see you at the movies.